The Built How Podcast is part of the Win Make Give Podcast Network. Welcome to the Built How Podcast. My name is Ben Kinney. I am so excited because we are interviewing number one real estate professionals and asking a simple question. How did you build the business that you have today? I am so excited for this interview. Get ready to learn. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Built Out Podcast. My name is Jesse Garcia, and I am here with John Selby, team leader of the Selby team with Compass in San Diego, California. John and his team closed about 84 units last year with an average purchase price of about $950 to $1 million and closing over $1.5 million in GCI. John, how are you today, sir? Good, good. How are you doing, Jesse? Doing excellent, man. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Excellent. Well, let's dive into it, man. You you have built a an amazing business, and you know I'd love our listeners to learn more about how you did that. And so, how'd you get started in real estate? Yeah, weird. Uh, well, not not really weird, I guess. But I it's a somewhat of a family business. I have an aunt in the business. I have a cousin in the business, and of course, I have my mother in the business. Um, so, growing up, I was kind of immersed in it. Um, I had intended to take a gap year out of high school. And my mom said, you're not doing that without doing something. So, <laughs> so she, uh, she forced me basically to get my real estate license um, during that year. So I had it in my back pocket. I went off to college after that, got a degree in engineering, um, worked in that field for a while, kind of realized there was a cap in the, in the industry and sitting behind a desk was really not for me, you know, 24 seven. Um, and working for somebody else was also an issue. I watched myself get billed out at like $150 an hour. And I was making like 30 of that, you know, and I'm going, what the heck? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, so I moved back to San Diego after that and, um, got into real estate. I committed to three years. I said, if I can't make it in three years, I'm going to go back to engineering and know that that's my fate. Um, and it was the third year that things just took off and I knew I was never going to look back. Nice. So you were licensed at 18 and yep. you started selling at 2014. And so that was that three-year gap. So from 14 to 17 is is the time you gave yourself? Yeah, basically. Yeah. Beginning of 14. And I said, you know, by 2017, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't doing um the numbers and you know, I wasn't I wasn't cutting it. Then I was gonna um, you know, just get out, cut cut ties, and I could use, you know, that was a short enough time that I could probably jump back into engineering and not have too much of a delay. Um, and all that. And I knew, you know, I basically said, you know, from, from then till I, till for those three years, I would just do whatever it took. So for a year and a half or so, I had some side hustles. Um, you know, then I just sweated bullets while I was trying to, I'm sorry about that. No, you're good. Um, then I was just trying to, um, you know, get fully immersed after that. And, you know, year three, uh, I, I did like 26, um, transactions that year and I knew, okay, there's no reason to look back. I've got this. Uh, how do we keep doing that? You know, so yeah, nice. And so now um, you have about four agents on your team, uh, about three different administrator uh, operator roles. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we spoke, you said you really run a lean and mean team. Walk me through kind of the development of your team and 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 kind of how it's grown since you joined. Yeah. So when, uh, when I was, when I came in on with my mom, it was her. And I think she had just hired an assistant at that point. She had maybe had an assistant for like a year, um, who also was like kind of a transaction coordinator. So it was a very small team. It was basically my mom, her, and then I kind of came on board and I was just following everybody around and trying to figure things out. Um, so we did that for, for a long time. We went through maybe two more assistants for various different reasons. Um, and then it was 20, I want to say it was 2018. I realized the power of like marketing and I realized the power of all that. So I thought, okay, um, I think we need to bring on a marketing assistant or, um, you know, someone that can do that more full time. Cause before that it was just me going, all right, how do we hustle this? Let's get some Facebook ads out. Let's get some mm -hmm. of this out. Let's get some of that out. Um, so I brought that person on board and that allowed us to grow substantially. So our business numbers went up from there. Um, we went to like somewhere in the range of like 55 to 60 deals a year. And we were previously around 35 to 40 deals a year. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we climbed on that. And then 
Um, you know, and then that allowed us to then add some agents to the team and um, so on and so forth. But nonetheless, we're still, you know, we're doing 80 plus transactions, which um, is is a decent number of transactions for the amount of agents that we have mm-hmm. uh, on the team. Um, and I do that by having the staff behind us so that each person can do more production as opposed to spending their time spinning their wheels and, um, you know, trying to figure out how to do the paperwork and trying to figure out how to do all the like random Facebook posts and all of that stuff. Like our agents, you know, always hire a transaction coordinator. Um, one of our admin assistants, his role is not just to assist me, but to assist everybody. He's kind of a, I, we call him a client care coordinator. Um, mm-hmm. So his job is to make sure that the client's happy from, you know, the day that they're introduced to him to the day that we close escrow and then beyond. Um, so we use that role to take up some stuff that an agent would necessarily do, which is like checking in on paperwork and checking in on this and checking in on that, you know, um, they can, you know, focus on the high dollar activities, which is what we, you know, which is what we need to be doing, but we get so caught up in all the rest of it. No, hundred percent. And I know, um, you know, you said, um, what drives you is developing the systems that allow your team members to be 100% focused and, um, you know, present with your clients. And so kind of walk me through what those systems look like. Yeah. So systems, those systems being, um, you know, it, how do I put this? It's the, you know, the staff on the back end. So this, that we have our client care coordinator has a process. So once, a, once one of our agents is like showing property, the client care coordinator gets involved and starts, you know, helping with reminders and helping with um, small tasks. And then especially once we start writing offers and actually getting into escrow, that person's ordering, you know, inspections, ordering, um, uh, what do you call it? Like appraisals, you know, making sure meetings and things like that are happening, setting reminders and doing things that would bog down an agent so that that agent can obviously still help that client and, and really do a good job for that client, but also can focus on that other buyer that's out there showing property and looking at things or, sh- or work with that seller who, you know, needs some handholding and things like that. Uh, we, we free up their time you know, in that regard. So that, that system is in place. We have a ton of online systems with our, you know, with our CRM that have automatic, you know, notifications to remind you, Hey, this person needs to be, you know, followed up with or, or, um, or touched. Um, and so they go through, through that whole process. And then on the lead side of things, we have inside sales agents who deal with a lot of that follow-up for the, for our agents so that they don't Mm -hmm. have to sit there and make four hours of phone calls every day. Uh, to try to get a lead, uh, we we have those phone calls being made for them, and then it's handed off once they're ready to go look at property. So we're really keeping them in like that genius zone, um, and and not getting them bogged down with all the things that realistically agents hate to do. You know, the good yeah. agents take the calls and do that, but if but nobody likes doing it. You go ask an agent. I mean, okay, that's that's why there's probably agents out there that are sick and demented and they do like doing that. But <laughs> the reality is most people don't like sitting there on the phone doing all that like cold calling follow up and and you know the hard stuff. So uh, we try to make it as easy as possible to keep them in, you know, the in the the lane that makes the most money. Yeah, the highest and best use of their time. Yep, exactly. And so <clears throat> one of the things that um you know, going into a new year with the market shifting, kind of where is your focus? What are, you know, as a leader of the team, what are you portraying to your your team members? Yeah, so I'm super focused on just watching the market and where it's going at every minute. I mean, we've had to make, I would say probably five, maybe six adjustments since April alone in our strategies, not only on the buy side, but on the listing side and how we can be most effective. So following those trends, staying hyper focused on you know what's going on with interest rates, what's going on with buyers, you know buyers' confidence, um, how sellers are feeling, you know because they were getting the world and now these listings are sitting on the market for six months, not six months, maybe sixty days, whatever. Um, but you know, so staying hyper focused on that, and then with the agents, you know, staying extremely focused on all of the activities that make us money. That is, you know, staying in touch with people making sure they're going back to all those buyers that maybe lost out in the past couple of years um, in, you know, in bidding wars and whatnot and saying, Hey, there's an opportunity. And in many markets in San Diego, we're back to like early 2021 pricing on houses. So it's kind of just wiped everything clean and they're getting it. Of course, interest rates are high, um, but that can be temporary. So it's, it's talking through those stories and, you know, making sure we're helping the buyer or the seller make the best decision um, by educating them and giving them, you know, as much data as we possibly can and making sure it's like accurate data, not just like news article data, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. And and <clears throat> uh, in, I was just going to bring that up because you were very 
um, uh, focused on educating your clients. Yeah. And one thing you said that, that resonated with me earlier, you were like, you know, our clients don't blame us when they bought in early 2022, because you went through a full education process and fully disclosed was completely transparent as to what was going on. Tell me more about that, because I yeah. think that's such a, a crucial statement to just the industry overall yeah. is a, the more you educate and the more you're completely transparent, you're leaving all your cards on the table, you know, they're, they're making a decision that's best for them. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's a big key for us is, is educating the client. So, you know, almost every single buyer of ours goes through a buyer consultation with us where we sit down with them. Pro, you know, number one priority is answer all their burning questions because, you know, they have a lot of them. Uh, but then going through what they can expect, where the market's at, what interest rates are doing, you know, what their interest rate means for them. And then overall getting like the, the true reason behind why they're buying so that we can make sure that we're helping them make the right decision. Um, and so something that we made a decision to start kind of asking and doing early, I would say it was like probably, I've, I've done it for a long time, but I really made a presence of doing it in 2021 was saying like, how, like, what's your plan with this house? How long do you plan to be in this house for? And if I was getting answers like, oh, you know, I'll be here six months and then we'll maybe sell it or whatever. I'm like, you know, I'd ask further questions going like, are you know, are you sure you want to do that? And mm -hmm. why do you want to do that? And would you be okay with making an investment property if that happened, if you got you know, relocated? We're in San Diego, so we have military. Um, so we work with a lot of military and it's like, they could be here on a year contract, they could be here on a two-year contract, they could be here on a five-year contract. Um, so making sure that they understand that when they're, you know, buying and they're on a two-year contract, you know, are they okay with keeping that property as a rental when they leave? And most of the time they are, but making sure they ask those questions so that if something happens like it did in April, where, you know, we sold houses in April and, and uh, March and February. And a lot of those people, they, I don't know if they're necessarily underwater, but they're not ahead at all right now, um, mm -hmm. you know, on the, on the prices they bought it. But I've had zero calls saying, Hey, John, darn you. I can't believe it. And I don't feel bad about it because I know every single one of those buyers that we put in had a five-year plan at least. Mm -hmm. Well, and, yeah. and you challenge those thought process a little bit, right? Yeah. Like you, it wasn't just, okay, you want to buy a house? No, great. Let's go look. Like you, yeah. you educated them, but also challenged their thought process as, at the same time. Yeah. And, I would be, I would, I would be like devastated if somebody called me up and said, John, I'm, I'm hosed right now because of this. And you know, you didn't, you didn't help me or you didn't tell me like, we're, we have a fiduciary duty, you know, obviously we, we sell houses and that's our job, but you know, we have to like ask the underlying questions too, mm -hmm. to make sure that we're actually doing the right thing by selling them a house. No, hundred percent. And so with the market shift and, you know, uh, assuming you're going to continue to grow your team, does, is your, um, is your standard for hiring changing or did you have a standard that you were like, this is, you know, we're not going to hire anyone who can fog a mirror. This is what we're looking for. Yeah. Our standard has always just been, um, it's been pretty consistent in the sense that, um, you know, we're always looking for ambitious people, but I want to make sure that they have good ethics behind them and they're not like commission breath type of agents. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of key words that you hear out there that like, I just want to get the deal or, you know, da, 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 you know the things like that, that yeah. uh, I shy away from because I don't want anybody on my team making decisions for the paycheck. You know, mm -hmm. um, there's points where all of us need money, um, but we can't, we can't make it help somebody make a decision based on our financial backing, right? It has to be the best decision for them. And if we help them make that best decision, then we get paid, but it shouldn't be mm -hmm. the other way around. Um, so I really ensure that that's the case. You know, if, if I'm hiring a new agent, I set the expectation that they could go six months or nine months without even getting one single paycheck. And are they financially okay with that? And can they f physically do that? That's not my goal. I would love for them to sell a house in two months, but... Mm -hmm. If they can't stay nine months, then I'm going to be concerned about hiring them because then you get them in a position where they're, I wouldn't say forcing somebody to buy a house, but their, their goal to have that person buy a house might be more than the buyer's goal to actually buy the house. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to put them in or the buyer in that situation. No, I love that. Um, and it sets the standard of, Hey, you're no, we're here to add value. We're here to educate, you know, we're here to help them make the right decision, not just collect a commission check. Right. Um, and then one, one last thing that I would love to talk to you about, um, you know, your, and we don't need to dive into numbers, but your profitability 
is just insane. And, you know, you and I both talked about the book Profit First yep. and, you know, you run your business based on a profit first model. So tell me more about, you know, did that start early on or was that something that you adopted later and kind of what was the benefit uh, other than the obvious of being more profitable, but did you see a massive change in your numbers when you adopted that? Yeah. So um, I adopted it later on. It was definitely not from the beginning. I want to say, I to think back. It was at least 2019. It might've been 2018 when I put it in place, but I, I feel like in my head it's 2019. Um, but what it did is I, I would run my, I would run my business off. Oh yeah. There's money in the bank account. Okay. Yeah. I can do this, you know, and never like think about, um, you know, anything else. And I was lucky because I was closing deals. And so there was always money in the bank account and that mm -hmm. was, that was great. Uh, but realize, you know, hey, if something changes, um, I should probably know where this money's going and also how much of it I'm keeping and, you know, and so on. And yeah. I conveniently read that book right after. And so what I do now is our business has buckets in our account. Um, and there is, you know, a profit bucket. There is a operations bucket. There's a marketing bucket. There's a taxes bucket. Um, there's a profit sharing bucket. And then there's a rainy day fund bucket. And so money goes into that before anything meaning you know i sell a house ten thousand dollar commission check goes it comes in you know thirty three thousand of that goes into the to the operations you know 1500 goes into the taxes 1500 goes into the marketing um five five hundred goes into the profit sharing account mm -hmm. you know and 1.5 goes into the rainy day fund and then everything else gets taken out and moved to another account and basically i have to run it off of those five accounts and each one has their criteria. So um, I actually have it written like 5% do not touch. This is for taxes. Like meaning like you can't touch this account, you know, and this one's marketing. So anytime I like look at, you know, paying off bills and paying off things like, okay, what are my marketing expenses? And I pay those directly out of that marketing account. And then, you know, typically everything else after that falls into operations. So it all just, gets, you know, the rest of it gets paid out of that. Um, and so by doing that, it's just really allowed me to stay pretty, pretty profitable. I mean, the, you know, you, you can make changes over the years, but as long as you do that in the beginning, um, you're at least setting yourself up for success. And so we're, we're, yeah, we're highly profitable north of 30%. So did, did you, um, uh, you know, did you see a dramatic increase in profitability when you adopted that model or were you already pretty profitable beforehand? You just wanted more of a solid foundation. I was already super profitable before, luckily. Um, it just allowed me to set a, a, a foundation. And so, you know, actually really worked well because the last two years were huge years. Um, and then this year, just naturally, um, with commission compression and prices coming down and some uncertainty, we're probably going to be a few deals short of last year. So we're making a little bit less money. Um, but what it allowed me to do is look at things and go, okay, wow, our, our marketing budget is based on last year and the year before that's numbers. I need to figure out how to redo that. And I don't necessarily mm -hmm. just cut something out automatically, but now I'm thinking about it and I'm going, okay, I need to reduce this down because I crept from 15% to 18%, um, and 18% is a little bit too high. So how do I get that back down? And I just start thinking about that now, as opposed mm -hmm. to like, holy crap, my money's gone. What do I do? <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and going into 2023, you know, everyone's business planning, well, at least most people that are running a, a profitable business right now are business planning. Um, are you seeing any of the, um, those buckets change as far as what you normally are putting in and or spending based on strategy? No. Um, I'm going to keep them the same and my goal is going to be to stay the same. Um, I would love to push marketing up even a little bit with that happening, you know, with the, with the market shift. But, um, you know, realistically, if I was putting 15%, I was probably spending around 12% of that again with the, you know, with the profit or sorry, with the, with the total gross income kind of changing a little bit this year, that 12%, which would have been of last year is now, you know, 15% mm -hmm. of this year. So I just have to tweak that a little bit. Um, but my goal is always to spend around 15% of what we bring in. And I feel like if doing that, we can continue to grow. Um, you know, if I see an opportunity that I think is going to be great, I can take a little bit of a risk and I can say, Hey, let's add another percent or two to that and, and try it out. Um, but no, I'm not going to, my plan is not to reduce any of that down. If anything, my goal is to keep pushing, um, you know, and keep staying, mm -hmm. keep staying ahead of it all. Um, and not backing out. And if I heard you correctly, um, 
so you're budgeting like every, every time you get a commission coming in, you're budgeting 15% for marketing. Every but time. historically you may have only been spending 12. So you actually have a 3% cushion to go, Oh, Hey, the market's shifting. Let's add a little bit more into this marketing funnel. This lead generation source is, is did I hear you correctly on that? Yeah. Yeah. So I, yeah, I usually have a little bit extra and where it worked for me this year was that, um, you know, we're seeing a slight, like we're going to see probably like a 10% or so reduction in overall sales for the year. Um, it allowed me though, to continue spending like I was, like I was making 10% more because I had a little bit extra in there and not get behind. Mm. Meaning I didn't look back and now I've spent, you know, I don't know if I, if my marketing budget was, you know, $50,000, I didn't just like accidentally spend $80,000 and I don't even have it. You know, I, um, you know, I'm able to kind of stay ahead of it. And now I see, okay, wait, we're spending a little bit more than we should be. Mm -hmm. Let's tweak it a little bit and change and adjust some stuff. And I have some time built in there for that. So that's what it's- And you're holding every dollar accountable that you're spending. Like, do you know exactly, hey, this dollar is for this marketing source and we know if we're getting an ROI on that? I do, yeah. I look at all of those. Um, I track on the back end every lead source that we have and percentage of our overall business. So that's another good thing about- um, me running everything in percentages is I also track all my leads in percentages. So I can know if, you know, if sphere past clients and referral is 70% of my um, overall, and I'm spending 3% of my overall marketing budget on it. And, mm-hmm. but I've, I've got, you know, online leads that are 2% of my overall sales. Why am I spending 30% of my marketing budget on it? So by having those percentages in front of me all the time, I can analyze each source and figure it out. You know, like earlier this year, we cut out Zillow completely. We cut out all um, like third party online lead generation. And we said, you know, none of this is working to the level that we need it to be working we should just invest in ourselves. So we're redeveloping our entire website. We're putting our own lead funnels in place, pretty much everything that all these third parties were doing. Um, and we're doing it for about the same amount of money that we were spending mm-hmm. there, but we own everything, of all of it. We have full control over it all. Um, and I'm optimistic that it's going to bring in higher quality leads because I can set the funnel where I want it to be. Mm-hmm. And so is that strategy less about going after like Zillow cold leads versus, hey, we're going to take that same amount of money and invest it into people that already know and trust us and have used us and get referrals and nurture that sphere? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, do that and then have little branches that go out. Because obviously, if you just nurture your sphere and you never go out to find new people, at some point that's going to dwindle down and you're going to be behind. And now all of a sudden your transaction numbers are going down. And if we want to push forward, we got to constantly add people to that. But nurture those people as a priority and have little branches going out where we're bringing in new people slowly, slow enough, mm-hmm. uh, sorry, not slow enough, fast enough, but also at the, at the right pace to where we're not just getting a bunch of leads that don't even want to talk to us and clicked on a pretty picture or something like that. Mm-hmm. Well, John, man, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I love, you know, the, the uh, running a profit first business model. I like that. Um, and for our listeners that are like, Hey man, I got to look this guy up. I got to follow his journey or if I have a referral, whatnot, how, what's the best way to reach out if you don't mind sharing? Yeah, no problem. Um, you can reach me on my cell phone anytime, um, which is 619-251-0979. You can check our website out, which is selbycellsandiego.com. Um, or you can email me at john at selbycellsandiego.com. Um, super responsive. So I'd love to hear from, you know, anybody who has got questions, um, comments or anything like that. I'm always happy to chat. I love to mastermind and talk to other agents. So awesome, man. Most, most top producers do. <laughs> um, you need to, you're not yeah. the smartest one, you know, you need everybody's information. Otherwise you're just going to get stagnant and start going crazy. So hundred <laughs> percent, man. Well, Hey, I appreciate you making the time to be on the built out podcast. It's been a pleasure talking to you and just much success to you in 2023. Thank you. Likewise to you guys. Have a good one. You too.